Good evening. We have an interesting one this evening. In the sixth book of Plato's Republic, he describes what he calls the perfect model of the good. It's a model. He says the greatest thing to learn is the idea of the good. The reason for that is then you can discover the use to which justice, the quality of the just justice, and all the rest become useful and beneficial. And I have another one. He asks in the same way that this exploration of the idea of the good should reveal in what way the just and the beautiful is good. Now, I took a little liberty here in the translation. Very often translators call this just things. Just things and beautiful things. And I don't think that's what's intended. And the reasons for that change is because of a very interesting grammatical point, which is the Greek has it in the neuter plural, and it's only things when an article is with it. There's no article with it. The Rouse translation ignores it, and he makes a footnote in that respect, and wants to read it as just things. Now, so what's at issue? What's at issue? Well, it's this is the issue, you see. If they are just things, then there's a whole class of things which you might call just. That could be customs, laws, they can be a class of just things. But if he's talking about the quality of justice, then it doesn't take the definite article. It takes just what it is, neuter plural. What would that mean? That would mean that he's not talking about these things, but he's talking about the just. And all the rest, then, is justice, courage, temperance, wisdom. That's the class of things that have qualities akin to the just quality and all the rest. Yeah, more than that. More than that. He does it again when he says, what you must discover is the way that the just and the beautiful is good. Just things, beautiful things. Same thing. You see, now if we take that out and use our way of expressing it, then he's saying that ethics itself, this is ethics. It's not very useful for man unless you understand this curious thing that he calls the model of the good. It's a perfect model. And the beautiful. That would, in fact, be the idea of the good itself. It's not merely experiencing the idea of the good as beautiful, but to learn, the greatest thing is to learn, is this so that you can then use it. If you use it, then it becomes beneficial. Right? Then it can have a goal, it can be good, you can use it to something. or to put it into modern language. It runs through the whole republic. It's not sufficient to be good or to be ethical. Because if you lead a perfectly good life in the sense of pure ethics, then in the myth of Ur, you have then escaped. You have escaped a great deal of suffering. You've just decided to live in such a way 
as to remain good, not achieving anything necessarily, but to avoid all evil, and therefore to be ethical in that sense. But that doesn't mean that one has learned anything through suffering and through mistakes. It means you chose to live an ethical life for its own goodness. Now what's interesting about that idea is that for Plato, the people that leave a good life, goodness, untouched by suffering and evil, these are the people who come back, are reincarnated, and they're the people who become the tyrants. They become the tyrants. That's the, the source of tyranny. And the, to understand that, of course, is the whole republic. That's the goal of the republic, to understand how just people emerge and how unjust people emerge. The unjust person, to be a tyrant, he must have great abilities, memory, right, rhetoric, Courage has to keep us cool at certain times. He has to then give the, give the appearance of being just and wise in everything he does to be most skillful as a tyrant. And therefore he has a kinship with these things, but there's only one thing he lacks. And that is the kind of understanding that must follow from mastering this perfect model of the good. That is to say, they can't use the natural endowments they have from a prior existence. Since they can't use it, then they are captured by the mob and mob ethics reigns in their soul and they become the tyrants. That would be worthwhile exploring in depth sometime. But I would like to talk about it in another way. What happens to this whole exploration of Plato. It presupposes reincarnation. Without the idea of reincarnation, there's no Plato. Let's see if I can hopefully make that clear. There is so much to master. There's so much to learn philosophically that for Plato, you're very fortunate if you live in some uh, small town away from big metropolises. If you had an early sickness that keeps you out of the influence of the many, or if you're very fortunate you join a small circle of people and do it together. The essential thing, however, is that you do not bring attention upon yourself because the hostility of the many will turn against you. Therefore, with such a difficulty even engaging in this curious thing called philosophy, Plato reflects on this issue of reincarnation. His myths are full of it. But in the Republic, there's a place in the Republic where the idea of reincarnation takes on a splendid form. I call it the golden thread through many reincarnations. And it deals with the perfect model of the good. Let this line represent time. And each one of these, a life, a death, reborn, etc. The thread, the thread that connects reincarnations, what makes reincarnations meaningful for Plato, the thread, the golden thread through reincarnations. Socrates describes as the need to continue the dialogue, the very republic, the need to continue the dialogue with a group of people so that when they are reborn together, they can continue this dialogue. He thinks the people surrounding him in the Republic will be reincarnated at, some, reincarnated at some future time, and again they will face the same issues, having brought with them all of the experience of their past. 
So he says, we must convince those people around us about these ideas so that in a future time, when we are together, we can continue the dialogue. And they may then be able to achieve something significant and bring it to the discussion. So the whole republic is an idea of reincarnation. I'd like to just read you one small paragraph where he makes that point. It's at about the point where he's talking at 50, uh, 498. I'm in the low, but at page 61. You really seem to be very much in earnest, Socrates, he said. Yet I think most of your hearers are even more earnest in their opposition and will not be in the least convinced, beginning with Thrasymachus. Socrates says, do not try to breed a quarrel between me and Thrasymachus, who have just become friends and were not enemies before either. For we will spare no effort until we either convince him and the rest, or achieve something that will profit them when they come to that life in which they will be born again and meet with such discussions as these. So therefore, he thinks these discussions will go on and we come together to pursue it and continue it, and that's the golden thread through many reincarnations. That is the dialogue. That's the thread. And among the kinds of talks you can have and explore, because by dialogue and the dialectic you come to try to understand and learn, among all the things that they're there to learn and to master, the highest, the greatest, is the idea of the good. For that's the greatest thing to learn is the idea of the good, the use of which makes the just quality and all the rest become useful and beneficial. So it can make ethics useful, it can make enlightenment experiences useful. That's his challenge, that's what he's doing. I put the question mark here, it doesn't need it. Right. So we want to explore in what way the just and the beautiful is good, because unless that's discovered, he says to understand everything else is insignificant if you don't understand in what way the just and the beautiful is good. That's the central point. Well, how does he pursue it? That's what we take a look at. Let's take a look at it. Now, first of all, it's a model. It's a model. That word is very important. It's a model. Model means you have to try to master the model and then find a way to apply it. It's a model. It's a perfect model. And in it we'll come across an idea which I'd like to call the nature of structural similarity. Now that's the essential point, and again and again in many dialogues, I've given it this name. What that means is between two things that are significant, they are designed in such a way that the structure that lies in each is similar to one another. Right? That's what it means. The terms can vary, the terms can vary, the relationships are constant. Terms vary between each. 
but the relations between them are constant. Now let's see if we can see that. And we want to see if that's true, why it's so significant, and why it, make it, why it may make that, therefore, most useful and beneficial to see and understand. Why is this so significant? He yeah, asked the question. Because if you do understand it and grasp it, then you'll see something very, very significant. And therefore, these things become useful and beneficial. So let's take a look at these two sets of things. He says we all start. See, we start over here in the realm of appearance. The appearance. Appearance and reality. Appearance and reality. That's the way we're going to start. That means he's going to set out a certain number of things here in the realm of appearance. He's going to set out a certain number of things here in reality, and they're going to have the same structure. There's a similarity in structure between the two. If that's the case, you know what you do? Whenever you're approaching a study where you have things that are structurally similar, Pick, pick, pick carefully. <laughs> pick the one that's familiar to you. Pick this, master this. Master the appearance, master the similar, and apply it to the complex. That is to say, proceed from the known, more familiar, known and familiar, to the less known or unknown. Practice with appearance. Work with appearance. Master appearance. Then you will see the essential terms. They're the relations. See, they are the relations. Then all you need to do is to take the relationships in the world of appearance. Let the terms drop out put it into the way in which you're going to talk about reality, and it will fit. So he starts over here with the world of appearance, and he says, are there not beautiful and good things? Of course. Of course. Over here, beautiful and good things. He says, by the way, when you call them beautiful and good things, don't we assume if we call them beautiful and good, there's some idea that they all share, exhibit? Oh yeah, some single ideal? Because if I say those are good things and those are beautiful things, then there must be some ideal I have about beauty which I can see in all of those things, and so too good. It's therefore, you know what? Looks like then there's a single essence that permeates them both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or each, excuse me, a single essence that permeates each. I said, now look here, now you have two things, you see. You have two things. We have beautiful things and ideals. Notice what he does, see? We're going to take this and talk about this, and then we'll talk about this. He says, well, look here. First of all, when we take a look at beautiful things, they are seen, not thought. Ah, that's right. That goes with this. Ah. The single perfect ideal behind beautiful things and good things, that appeals to the mind. It's not seen. See? Right? Seen, not thought. Thought, not seen. Ah, same structure, see? Seen, not thought. Right? Appeals to the mind, thought, process, not seen. That's, a, that's what we're going to do for the rest of the time. You see, now watch it. Now, as he proceeds, he says, let's take a look again at what? All we're going to do, notice the way he proceeds. It's exactly the way in which we were talking. 
He's going to do all his homework on the realm of appearance. He's going to say, look here, would you not agree that you look out and you see trees? You see the tree over there. There's color in the tree. There's sight in the eye. In order to see it, you need a third thing, an essential thing, and that's light, without which you couldn't then, of course, see the green of the tree. That's all he needs. See, that's a model. That's the beginning of a model. And now he's going to focus on sight and the power of being seen, because light gives the power of being seen. He says, you know, there's a very precious bond between sight and the, because it has a power of being seen. There's a very interesting bond here. Very interesting bond. Later, we're going to put something else here and something else here. We're working out the relations just in the realm of appearance. Hey, so now he reflects and he says, you know, sight, that's not the sun, nor is sight in the eye. But both, right? sight is the most sunlike. Why does he say that? He says sight ex goes out to meet its object. Right? There's a flow. It goes out and strikes the object. Right? We would say today that what happens is that the object itself radiates light waves. Somewhere along, somewhere along, whether it's in the eye or some distance, it doesn't matter, there's a linkage. One affects the other. Either you put it in the eye or not. For the Greeks, the idea is that the sight itself, seeing, is an inundation, a flow until it, right, it reaches the object. And then it comes into contact, not with the object, but the color of the object. You see, in a way, very similar to uh, the sun. The sun, there's an inundation. Light proceeds, flows. There's a, a, a uh, wave-like property to the light moving from the sun, very much like sight, you see. So he has a parallel property, same kind of relation between them. He said, the sun is not sight. Sun's not sight. But it's the cause of sight. Because without light, you couldn't see. Therefore, it's the cause of sight. Or we would say the condition for sight. And what's interesting, though, is that sight can also, right, sight is seen, right? You can see, it can be seen by, the, by sight itself. That is to say, you can turn about and also by sight see the sun. Oh, that's a very splendid thing. That's a very splendid thing. Now we have everything we need. All we're going to substitute is things of the mind. That's perfect model of the good. Let's see how he does it. Now he's in the realm of the mind. There is, we say, a divine splendor, a luminosity, a divine luminosity. A radiance. When it's encountered, it's an overwhelming experience and experienced as beauty. Wow, that is intensely beautiful. On reflection, you can discover certain things about it. This overwhelming blissful experience has a cause. That is the good itself. This is also called the idea of the good. Because, as we mentioned before, the word idea should have a capital. An idea in Greek is, a, that's a Greek word, idea. It means to behold, to behold the good that's a divine radiance.
That's the luminosity. That's the experience that so often is mentioned in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and other works. So, look here. The good gives birth to the idea of the good. That's its source. That's its source. Socrates in the Republic calls that begetting. He said, the good begat, the idea of the good. It begat this. It's the cause of this. Hmm. Well then, now notice we can go right back to what we were doing before, only we're now going to shift the terms and go into the realm of the mind. Because the sun gave birth to our light. As the good gives birth to or begets this divine luminosity. Therefore, what the good affects by its influence in the region of the mind, right, what it affects, in the, see this is a full mindful experience, if you don't mind my putting, right, I don't think the mind is necessarily, by the way, in the head, but just convention allows me to put it in here for the moment, but it isn't any more than hearing is in the ear. It's not in the brain, it's not that part, but just for convention we're going to use that. Therefore what the good affects by its influence in the region of mind, towards mind and things thought. Now this word, towards mind and things thought, that's really, when you see this language, it's really intelligence, towards intelligence and intelligible thought, right? But we'll use this language because this is the language of Rouse for the moment. So, notice, same parallel. What the good, what the good affects by its influence of the region of mind, just so the sun in the region of seeing towards, towards mind, towards sight, and things thought, and things seen, notice parallel, parallel language, the only thing that changes are the terms, relations are constant. Therefore, what the good affects by its influence, the region of mind, so too in the, uh, the sun affects by its influence in the region of sight, towards sight and things seen. It's a parallel. Parallel, strict parallel. Therefore, structural similarity is developing through this entire work. Ah, well then what can we do with it? He said, well, that's very interesting, then, if we have that kind of strict relationship between the two. And he says, you know what it is? He said, let's go back now to the realm of sight. All right, now he's, what he's going to do? He's going to work out the next step in sight, substituted for the things of the mind. He says, when the individual tries to perceive things by the stars and the moon, it sees dimly. It sees dimly and appears not to have any sight at all. But when he turns around towards that region which is visible and made visible by the sun and its light, then it sees clearly and sight appears to be in the eyes where before sight appeared to be only dimly possible in the eyes. Ah. So the same thing is true. Same thing, go in the realm of the mind now. Same thing in the mind. When the soul is in the realm of changing things, our visible world, then it opines. It makes all kinds of judgments and forms all kinds of judgments about visible things. Any judgment about visible things is an opinion. Any judgment about anything known through the senses is an opinion. Therefore, when the soul then turns its attention towards the visible world, the world of appearance, then it's dim-sighted and it keeps changing its opinions as things change. But, now notice we're doing the same thing as we did before, but when the soul turns around, right, towards that region where truth and real being shine, 
then it understands and knows it and appears to have reason. This is really noose, right? This is really noose, which is the, uh, we should really use the word intellect. Not reason. Reason is often just thought of as sequential thinking, discursive thinking. Whereas intellect is that part of the mind which is specially and most capable of gaining the greatest in intuitions. It's the metanoia, it's turning the mind around so that the higher part of the mind can be free to, to see the nature of reality. That's often called the intellect. So notice we have the same thing. Same structure, same structure, two realms, same relationships exist, terms vary. Now, it's not going to move. All right, we're not going to move a bit. And this idea of the good now, we're going back to the idea of the good, that's this realm. As you notice what it does, it provides truth for the things that are known. Now, what can be known? Hey, you know what can be known? In that experience, one recognizes immediately that it has a vitality. It's not a dead thing. It's mindful. And it's the very nature, everything else, by contrast, appears to be appearance because this gives one the experience of a higher and greater reality. Therefore, this is what one encounters in that experience. One says, my God, it's not just blissful. I encountered mindfulness. That is, the person recognizes that in that experience that their own being is not separable from being itself. They recognize that the liveliness that they encounter is no different than their own. And they recognize that it is mindful. It isn't dumb. Therefore, it shares all the principal qualities in that vision of what they themselves gain by that and share or open, are open to uh, that very experience. Let me put it another way, right? They didn't know that they were part of reality. They didn't know that the mind that they possess is no different than mind itself. And therefore, in that experience, in that magnificently beautiful experience, they recognize that beauty is not different than, the highest beauty is not different than metaphysics. Because this is all metaphysics, because you recognize the nature of reality is something that is ultimately real, mindful, and vitality, and that's no different than your self, innermost self. That's the self. Wow, that's me. That's it. Wow, whoopee. Now, What did that do? So, you know, what did that do? We have to talk about that. That experience then allows the person allows the person to say, by heavens, you know what? It is impossible for that not to be true. Because truth means that there is an integrity that's immediately immediately and integrally a part of the experience itself. See, some things are true because you can confirm it by something else. Uh, is it raining? I don't know. I'll go out and see. Oh, there's water there. There's water coming down. It looks like it's here and there. I can conclude by judgment, therefore, that it is true that it is raining. I go through a series of steps and confirm it, right? That's kind of a truth, an empirical truth in the realm of appearance. This is, doesn't go through stages. It recognizes immediately in what it is that that is true. Therefore, one experiences, therefore, an unquestioning thing that reveals itself as true. It's impossible to doubt its reality. Therefore, it's true. Therefore, he says, that experience provides truth to the things known. You know that this is true, this is true, this is true. It provides the truth to those things. 
And what does it do? It gives the power of knowing. Hey, it gives, see, it takes great power to know this. It takes power. It takes power. And it also, by the way, takes power to endure it. It's not some quiet little experience sitting on a, co on a uh, stuffed chair. It's an overwhelming experience. It takes strength to endure and to participate in and to even allow it to continue on a more profound level. Therefore, it also gives the power of knowing to the knower. See? That's a power. Therefore, this gives to the knower the power of knowing. Now, you see, what can you do? You're, you're making, see, you're, you say you're, this is recognition. Hey, that's mine. That's, uh, that's true. That's true. It's mine. Uh, hey, you know, that's reality. That's being. Oh, that's being. That's intelligence. That's, that's intel. Wow, that's intelligence itself. That is to say, from this, you can make certain judgments. You make certain judgments. You can even make the most curious judgment of all. And that's in the seventh book of the Republic, where he's talking about the allegory of the cave and the upper world. When one finally experiences the nature of the sun in its own place, in, its own, in itself and in its own place, one then reasons about it and concludes that this thing that was just experienced is also the cause of, in our world, the sun and the cause of seasons and the whole intelligible order in our, our world of appearance. So from this then, understanding can proceed. It's the cause of understanding and truth. Now, oh, look here, it's the cause of understanding and truth then. Because you can reflect upon it, you can make certain conclusions about it, that's understanding. And it's the cause of understanding and truth. Now, both understanding and truth are both beautiful, but they're not the good. They're only good-like. They're only like the good. That's only like the good. As splendid as that is, he says, that's not what it is. Why, he says, because there's something more beautiful, yet there's something more beautiful than this. Far more. For the eternal nature of the good has a higher value than all that we've said. That's what he says. The eternal nature of the good is far beyond that. And what he says is in both dignity and power. Now he goes back. All we're going to do now is talk about the other part of the world of appearance. And what are we going to do? Just pick up everything that he says and transfer it into the realm of the mind. He says, now let's go back to the sun. This, the sun gives us the power of being seen, doesn't it? No. Yeah. Not only that, it's the cause of their generation. Through the power of the sun, things are generated. They grow. There's a nurturing going on. And although it's not generation, it's the cause of it. Okay, what are we going to do? We're simply going to turn around and apply that to the realm of the mind. In the same way, therefore, it's the cause, right, in the realm of, of uh, the mind. The good is the cause of the things being known. It's the cause of knowledge and, and that uh, knowledge exists. But it, it is not itself knowledge, but it's their cause. Therefore, it transcends far beyond it in both dignity and power. This is the cause of this, this is the cause of this. This is ultimately the cause of all of this. What have we done? We've just lined up everything he says in the realm of appearance, and we've applied that to the realm of the mind. Now, why is this, you know, what is this, what is this telling us? See, that in Hinduism, 
you have the realm of appearance is maya. Maya. We have modern thought, nihilism. And it doesn't make any sense. It's all absurd. We have a Christian view that it really isn't important because after all, what's most important is the final judgment and this world is just a passageway between heaven and hell. It has no integrity. It has no purpose. It has no meaning. If there is this structural similarity, then it says, and it's saying over and over again, that the nature of reality is itself meaningful by necessity, since it's the realm of the mind, right? mind, knowledge, and truth. And if we can say there is a structural relationship between these, and if that's the way it's designed, then it has a hierarchy. This is higher than this. Reality is higher than that. It stands as model to copy. But that doesn't mean it's a copy and therefore merely illusion or like in a mirror. Why? Because if you're in a structural, if you're in a system of structural similarity, that means the basic intelligibility that's present in reality is shared in the realm of appearance. Therefore, it's meaningful. Go a step further. Therefore, the way we started this is to start with the golden thread. This is the realm of great meaning for Plato. You keep coming back to it again and again to pick up all the loose threads of meaning in your existence. You keep coming back not to pay for your sins, you come back in order to put the threads of meaning together in a continuous dialogue over many, many reincarnations. Therefore, this is a school. Our world of appearance is a school. It's a learning experience. We're here to learn. Hey, therefore, you're going to pick up some things now. You're going to pick up some things later. You're going to bring them all together. You're going to grow through different periods of reincarnation. Because once you start the game of philosophy, you're in it. He says this several times. In the Phaedrus, just to go a step further, he says, look here, in the next world, what you get is you get rewards and punishments. That's there. But you don't learn anything there. You only learn something here in this world for one reason. Here, learning changes you. You are changed. You are changed. Learning changes, transforms the learner. There's something about learning something in the body you take with you. Something like, there are many things that if you learn, you just keep with you. You keep with you. Personal insights stay with you. They change you. You drop away ignorance. You drop away illusions. You continue, you continue with that. That's the golden thread through your life, a life of meaning. And therefore, we come back again and again to pick it up more, bring it together. And Plato, therefore, says, at some further point in reincarnation, he says, we will meet again and with Thrasymachus and with the group here to continue the dialogue. Until when? Until it's all known, all understood, and therefore can bring about. What can it bring about? Well, what you're bringing about then if there is integrity here, then you can see in the world of appearance the nature of reality through its structural similarity. Ah, in the world of appearance, then you can see, you can still recognize that in the world, yes, there is the sun shining in the heavens, but looking at the sun, you also know that simultaneously that fits a model. All of it fits a model. The whole thing is meaningful.
Now, let's see what we can do with this because, see, being good or being just is itself not sufficient because there isn't any learning. There isn't any transformation of the individual. You learn to be good. You learn to bring about a certain condition by bringing the parts of the soul together as we spoke about previously. But you have to see how this model can make what it is you have become useful and beneficial. What will it be useful for and beneficial for? That you can bring yourself together in dialogue with others so that they too can see the nature of the good and the idea of the good unfold both in the realm of reality and the world of appearance. Therefore, you can say, I can see now that there's integrity in both. Reality, obviously, and appearance. So in what way is the just and the beautiful good? Through the idea of the good? as its offspring, as something then that brings order and rationality into our world of appearances, and therefore we stand as a mean between the two. This is where man is, you see. Man is not in the world of appearances. It's a mistake to think we're in the world, in one sense, obviously, in another sense, we're quite, of course, we are in this world, but we are the mean. We can turn our attention here and forget this, but we can also recognize its value, and therefore we can now experience the one and the other. And we can see that we're living in one kind of a universe in which the nature of reality and the world of appearances share the same structural similarity. That's what Plato calls in the Timaeus, the cosmos has created Right, in such a way that the very account of it is a likely story. See? The Greeks want this. They want the world of appearance to be shown to be meaningful and rational so that they can live within it as a rational being. Therefore, the whole story and all reflections about the nature of the world of appearances of the world has to be a likely story. Right? We want it to be likely. Uh, why likely? Likely story. To show its intelligibility so that we don't become nihilists and we can continue, therefore, in that higher world of the mind where we move through any number of reincarnations to continue the golden thread of the dialogue. That's what I wanted to do this evening. But I want to do one more thing. There's a certain part here I wanted to make sure I covered. Um, in this visible world, we see, right, we see in, at night and in this light of the luminaries of the heavens at night. And it looks like for our sight doesn't even appear that we have sight in our eyes. We see so dimly. But if we turn around and experience the world of the day, the same world, now we see clearly and sight appears to be in the eyes, appears to be in the eyes. Because what did, what did sight bring? Sight wrong. Sight is a necessary bond with light. They go together. Remember that bond, that precious bond between the two? Now in the realm of the mind, when you turn to truth and real being, which is what we talked about a moment ago, then you understand and you know it and you appear to have noose. Why appear? Uh, let me just read a short section here in Plato, which is I think one of the most very important section in the Republic. I'm at uh, 490A.
Then will it not be our reasonable defense that the real lover of knowledge by his nature strives towards real being and is not content to abide by, by this multitude of things which exist only in opinion? Forward he always goes, and he's never blunted, and never ceases from that love until he grasps the nature of, of what reality is in each case. By that part of the soul to which it belongs to grasp such a thing. And that is the part akin to real being. See, a part of him is akin to real being. Then going into this, then going into this and mingling with the real, he would beget mind and truth. And he knows he would know and truly live and be nourished. All right, what does he do? He begets mind and truth. See, you don't have, you don't have intelligence. <clears throat> you don't have, sight is a precious bond between the power of light Therefore, from this experience, we appear to have reason. We appear to have it. We don't have it. It is the nature of reality. Therefore, we appear to have news. We don't have it, like someone might have a possession. You don't have it. And therefore, out of that experience, one understands, knows, and appears to possess news. Now, the, uh, let me just make sure one thing, please. Um, I um, I th want to get in the fourth book. And give you a much better quote. And it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to do it. Um, curious when you read a book too many times, you know where it is in another book, but not in this one. So, um, Well, he has another quote that I was hoping to find. <laughs> I didn't find it. And uh,
Okay. No. No. Okay. I I uh, I don't have a I I know where it is in the other book. <laughs> but essentially what I was going to find is the exact quote where he makes this very point about appearing to have reason or a noose. But in any case, that's the talk. That's where I wanted to play with. That's what I wanted to do. Let me throw it open to you for questions. Good. Uh-oh. Yes. Is there a kind of simplistic overview that you could give to this whole thing that you, of everything you've just said? Is there a layman's way you could just roughly walk through it? And I'm, uh, I'm not fully grasping it. The primary purpose of the perfect model of the good is that if you if one can master it and learn it there is a consequence that is said to follow from it and that is this very experience itself of beauty and the very development of justice in an individual one can discover how it can be good the use of which the use of which, after you master the idea of the good, it can, it can then become useful and beneficial. That is to say, there are many people who experience this, and it doesn't do them, in one sense, any good. They may still have all kinds of difficulties in life. They may go through all kinds of scandals. Um, it doesn't do them any good until they finally try to discover what is it about it that can be said to make it beneficial to the person who has it. That's a very, very important question. Very important. It's, it's, um, uh, people that have more profound experiences always have this question. That why is it that even though they've entered into a very profound realm, we perhaps even can call it a divine realm, they still can have difficulties and shortcomings just like everyone else. And maybe in some cases worse. It didn't do them any good. It wasn't beneficial to them. Right. In the same way, there are many people uh, who are religious, that is to say, they spend their life trying to be just and good and there's something equally interesting about them. It doesn't, in one sense, doesn't, it isn't useful. They're like placid people. Um, there's no depth, they have no depth. There are many religious people who are so much concerned with trying to be good and to stay good, they can't do anything with the goodness they've achieved or the sense of justice, that just quality that they're able to capture. They're content with that, they stay with that. Plato is going the next step and he's saying, you know what, I think there's a model worth knowing. It's called the perfect model of the good. If you understand it, then these things can become useful to the person and beneficial. And what is it that's this perfect model of the good? The perfect model of the good is nothing other than a way of understanding the, what I call the structural similarity between the world of appearance and the nature of reality. That they both owe their existence to something higher, the good itself, and we are not in a war one against the other. There's no need to put down one in respect to the other. 
There's an integrity to the realm of appearance. We can appreciate it and grow in it. Let me put it in one other way. Um, why doesn't Socrates, or philosophers in the Socratic sense, why don't they just live a quiet life privately, engage in no dialogues with others, just enjoy that kind of state that's been open to them. Why don't they stay here? Why don't they cultivate samadhi? Why don't they cultivate the power of samadhi? Why don't they stay in that state of bliss? What advantage is there for them to come down or to go back into the cave in the everyday world? Why even do it? Isn't it all a, a, uh, an illusion? Something that you should spurn, avoid? Source of contamination? If it is then, we're in a trap. Then whatever designed this universe put us all in a cesspool, which we can't get out of except a few very enlightened beings, and there's no integrity to it whatsoever. Or it's all an illusion, and that's probably even worse. So therefore, what is he telling us here? That there's one thing, there's one thing, that's the cause of both, cause of both, that in this realm, there's a continuous reincarnation a continual growth, nurturing, development going on. We come back to learn. To, and what we, is, what we do come back to learn is that the nature of our reality has a fundamental property to it, which is a oneness. And the very dynamics of each is the same. And because of that, you're born in a good universe. That life can be meaningful here. It's part of an ongoing process. And I would call it the nature of the everyday world is our school. School is meaningful so long as you finally reach something that's beneficial. So I think his whole doctrine is that we're here to learn. That where we are is good. Mirrors the good. And we can bring along others with us. Is there a purpose in that? Is there a purpose in that? Yeah. For Plato? Or? Uh, talk more about it. Is there a purpose in that? Is there a purpose in that? Is there a purpose in that? And what? In uh, is there a purpose in my existence to learn about the good? Is that just is that purpose in and of itself purposeful? Is there a point? Is this going somewhere that is? Well. I don't, I'd like to get more of your question before I open my mouth, but... Am I moving from the bad to the good? Am I moving from ignorance to knowing, and in knowing, becoming the transcendent one? And that is the purpose, that ultimately the transcendent one gets to know itself through me somehow, or...? Oh, oh, oh. Why the beginning of yes. this whole yes. eternal game in a sense of um, yeah that's the the uh, what's sometimes called the ro uh, the, the ro romantic ideal um, first of all in Plato this itself to, uh, this itself this experience 
to the degree that one is able to contemplate that, in that experience, one discovers the, the, that life is meaningful and that's the purpose of existence. What's interesting about Plato, you see, is he goes a step further and says, but there's a cause to that which is even far beyond that. And that realm, which for Plato is only possible uh, to enter through the, which is through the dialectic, then there isn't any you or a God that's perceiving through either or both or simultaneously, all distinctions drop. All distinctions drop as you move from here to here. Here you can still make distinctions. As, as you as you move from here to here, ah, a poet, everybody can get involved in trying to discuss that. It's challenges, but to move from here to here, to the cause of it all, then that's the dia negativa about which nothing can be said in the sense that you're transcending language. Now, if you ask, um, how can we put in that one word, purpose? And I, in response to you, were saying, I think you can talk about purpose here. All right, this is the meaningful, this is the sense in which when we're in the middle of that, in that state and recognizing that state, that's the meaning of life, to, to recognize the very nature of oneself or the highest, highest experience possible for man is to recognize the nature of the self, know thyself, that is to know, that is meaning, to discover the basis of meaning is to know oneself. But here we have a higher one, don't we? So we're going to a higher one here, the good itself. Uh, when, when one is caught into, the, caught, I mean caught, one experience is this. When one, one is here experiencing this realm, it is not possible to think it can be anything higher. And that's why many people who experience things, that's the end, that's the final stuff. It's only upon later, for some people it never occurs, Someone might say, excuse me, if it was an experience, what's the cause of it? And that comes as a great shock, because then they realize that magnificent thing which they, they, they experience is, is, is an ultimate experience, but there's something beyond experience. There's something beyond experience. And for that realm, it's only a de negativa, no words. So to answer your question, I, I don't know whether you can use the word purpose for here. You can use the purpose here. Uh, and of course, of course, of course, you know, that's, that's the, uh, one of the great questions of all times, you know. Uh, to say, what is the meaning of existence is one thing. To say, what is the meaning of series of reincarnations is another. You're taking the same problem and expanding it in, in greater depth. And now that you say, oh well, now that we know that the end of that reincarnation is to experience this, understand it, and know it, that's nice to know. What's the purpose of that? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's a great question. Absolutely great. Um, and some romantic thinkers say, well, it gives God an opportunity to know himself through me. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the romanticist answer to that. Uh, the difficulty with all that language is that it's mixing different realms. And it's a nice way of poetically describing it, but language isn't appropriate for those. Not that you give up the mind. Uh,
don't know, on a clear day you can see forever. I, don't, I, I, uh, I love the question. I have it myself. But for myself, uh, the way I try to answer it is the way in which I do. And, uh, but I still think it's a meaningful question and important to try to answer it.